Picture this, a massive incineration pit in Marana, Arizona. In the flames, you can see the distinctive curves of the world's first all-composite business aircraft turning into black smoke. This is not an accident. It is a corporate execution. Raytheon, the parent company, decided it was cheaper to burn these planes than to let them fly. But what kind of math leads a company to commit fratricide on its own creation? Did they really destroy them to save money? Or were they trying to bury a secret liability that could have cost them billions? Here is what is really happening. Transport yourself to the early 1980s. The general aviation market is stagnant. It is dull. Everyone is flying aluminum tubes with propellers that have not changed since the 1960s. The industry is recovering from the 1970s oil crisis. Shipments of piston aircraft have dropped off a cliff. In 1978, they shipped over 17,000 planes. By 1986, that number had crashed to under 2,000. The business segment is dominated by reliable but boring dinosaurs. The Beechcraft King Air 200 is the king of the hill. It is a riveted aluminum design. It works, but it is not exciting. Fuel prices had surged. The market was begging for something efficient. But amid the economic recession and strict regulations, nobody was innovating. Innovation was dead. But Beechcraft had a vision. They did not just want an upgrade. They wanted a revolution. They wanted to build the Learjet killer. They looked at the market. The Learjet 35 was cruising at 450 knots. The King Air was chugging along at 280 knots. Beechcraft saw a gap. They envisioned an aircraft that combined the efficiency of a turboprop with the speed of a jet. They targeted a cruise speed of 353 miles per hour. They wanted a range of 1,742 miles. And the kicker, they wanted to reduce operating costs by 20 to 30 percent. How? By using space-age technology. Enter the visionary, Bert Rutan. He was fresh off successes with home-built planes like the Varies and Long EZ. In 1982, Beechcraft contracted him to refine their design. His company, Scaled Composites, built an 85% scale proof-of-concept model. This was the Model 115 that first flew in August 1983. This was not just a new shape, it was a new way of building. Rutan was an expert in lightweight composites. He was the man who would help design the Voyager, the plane that flew around the world non-stop in 1986. He believed that the future was not metal, it was plastic. Well, carbon fiber. Beechcraft bet the farm on this. This was not a side project. Beechcraft bet the entire company's future reputation on this single, strange-looking design. Development costs exceeded $300 million. Adjusted for inflation, that is over $800 million today. They started full-scale prototypes in 1985. The first flight was in February 1986. It took over 2,000 hours of testing to get certified. It was the largest investment Beechcraft had made since the King Air. They were gambling on unproven technology in a market where competitors like Cessna were playing it safe. They were trying to disrupt the market. So what did $300 million buy them? It bought them the Beechcraft Model 2000 Starship, and on paper, it was perfect. Just look at it. It featured a tandem wing configuration. It had forward canards for pitch control. It had variable sweep foreplanes that moved to optimize stall characteristics. In the back, it had two Pratt and Whitney Canada PT6A67A turboprop engines. They were mounted facing backward, pushing the plane through the air. Each one produced 1,200 shaft horsepower. But the real magic was the skin. It was an all-composite airframe. It was made primarily of carbon fiber and epoxy honeycomb sandwich panels. It was not riveted together like a tank. It was bonded. It was smooth. The fuselage was pressurized to 8.4 PSI. That allowed a cabin altitude of 6,000 feet while flying at 41,000 feet. The promise was incredible. Lighter materials meant fuel efficiency. No tail meant less drag. It looked like it fell out of a Star Wars movie. Composites promised a 20% weight reduction over aluminum. Beechcraft projected fuel burns of 5 to 600 pounds per hour. Compare that to the 800 plus pounds for jets. Because the 
propellers were in the back, there was no prop wash hitting the wings. That meant cleaner air and less drag. The cockpit was fully digital. It had Collins avionics with EFIS displays. The cabin was supposed to be quiet, under 80 decibels. It was designed to take off in just 2,500 feet. On paper, the Starship was the iPhone in a world of rotary phones. The Cessna Citation 1 jet cost around $3 million. It was fast, but it was thirsty. The Piper Cheyenne was slower and maintenance heavy. The Starship was supposed to be the bridge, the best of both worlds. But here is the thing nobody talks about. Physics met bureaucracy, and physics lost. The Starship was the first all-composite pressurized aircraft to seek FAA certification under FAR Part 23. The FAA had never seen anything like this before. They did not understand carbon fiber yet. They were conservative. So what did they do? They forced Beechcraft to over-engineer the structure. They mandated additional reinforcements. They wanted to prove damage tolerance. They made Beechcraft add layer after layer of composite material. The result? The plane that was supposed to be light as a feather ended up heavy as a tank. The target empty weight was 8,000 pounds. The actual weight, 10,085 pounds. That is over 2,000 pounds of dead weight, added just to make the regulators happy. This weight penalty killed the performance. The max cruise speed dropped to 312 knots. That was way below the promised 353 miles per hour. The climb rate suffered, dropping to 2,748 feet per minute. And the noise? It was supposed to be quiet, but the rear-mounted propellers created a problem. The exhaust from the engines hit the props, causing vibrations. The cabin noise reached 85 to 90 decibels. That is loud. A standard King Air was only 75 decibels. So you have a plane that is slower than a jet. It is louder than a turboprop. And then came the kicker. It cost $3.9 million. Think about that. For the same price, or even a little less, you could buy a Cessna Citation 5, which cost about $4 million. The Citation was a proven jet. It was faster. It was smoother. It was a known quantity. Adjusted for inflation, the Starship was competing against jets that offered better performance for the same money. Buyers looked at the Starship, then they looked at the Citation, and they made the safe choice. The market reaction was brutal. Almost nobody bought it. Only 53 were ever built. Sales peaked at just 11 units in 1990. The demand was so low that many units were leased instead of sold. The total fleet value was under $200 million. Remember, development cost over $300 million. This was a financial disaster. Production ran from 1989 to 1995. Delays pushed the initial deliveries to 1990. But the story does not end with the production line stopping. That happens all the time. Here is where it gets dark. Raytheon acquired Beechcraft in 1980. By 2003, they were looking at their books. They had a problem. They had a small fleet of very complex, very unique airplanes flying around, and they had a legal obligation to support them. This is the concept of supply chain obligations. When you build a plane, you have to support it. You have to make parts. You have to update manuals. You have to keep the engineering data current. Under FAA regulations, type certificate holders are obligated to provide parts and manuals for at least 10 years post-production. But for orphans like the Starship, this extended indefinitely. It involved costly inventory management for low-volume items. They had to keep custom carbon panels. They had to keep PT6 engine integrations. Raytheon did the math. Estimates suggested that supporting this tiny fleet would cost between $500,000 and $1 million per year. That is just to keep the lights on for the support division. Over 40 years, that could cost tens of millions of dollars. On the other side of the ledger, they looked at the buyback cost. If they bought every plane back for $1 million, it would cost them maybe $40 or $50 million total. Plus, there was the liability. If one of these unsupported planes crashed because a part was not available, Raytheon could be sued for millions. So the ruthless decision was made. They decided to purge the liability. It was not about safety, it was about the balance sheet. They decided it was cheaper to destroy the planes than to support them. This move aligned with Raytheon's broader portfolio streamlining. After merging with Hawker, they wanted to prioritize profitable lines like the King Air. They wanted to avoid the orphan fleet syndrome, seen in cases like the Eclipse 500 bankruptcy. In July 2003, the recall was announced. Raytheon offered owners significantly more money than the planes were worth. The market value of a used Starship had dropped to between $200,000 and $500,000. Raytheon offered $800,000 to 
$1 million each. It was an offer most owners could not refuse. Insurance was rising, maintenance was getting harder, so they took the check. Leaseholders were required to return the aircraft, and the execution began. The planes were flown to the Evergreen Air Center in Marana, Arizona. This is where airplanes go to die, Pinal Air Park, but they did not just park them, they murdered them. The process took place over 2003 and 2004. Photos show rows of starships being methodically dismantled. The engines were removed for resale, the avionics were stripped out, but the airframes, the beautiful carbon fiber fuselages, they were cut into pieces with diamond saws, they had to be destroyed completely. Raytheon wanted to ensure no reusable parts remained. They did not want a black market for Starship parts popping up that could lead to liability claims. The composite pieces were crushed or buried. They had to follow strict environmental regulations on carbon fiber disposal. It was a messy, violent end to a graceful machine. Imagine being one of the engineers who built this. Imagine being Bert Rutan or one of the designers at Scaled Composites. They had to watch as their creation, which had flown over 3,000 hours of testing without a major incident, was erased from the Earth. One of the proof-of-concept prototypes was publicly destroyed right in front of the team. It was a symbol. It symbolized the clash between engineering passion and corporate pragmatism. But not everyone surrendered. About six owners refused the buyback. They looked at the million-dollar check, and they ripped it up. They chose the plane over the money. One of them was an enthusiast named Robert Scherer. He knew the plane was special. He knew there was nothing else like it in the sky. They valued the aircraft's uniqueness over financial gain. But Raytheon did not make it easy for them. They retaliated. In 2003, Raytheon reportedly shredded their entire inventory of proprietary parts. They ceased all factory support. They stopped printing manuals. They deleted the engineering data. They effectively outlawed the support network. They forced owners to seek FAA exemptions or third-party approvals for repairs. If you owned a Starship, you were now on your own. You were flying a ghost. So how do they keep flying today? It is a rogue operation. The owners formed a secret network. They have to cannibalize the grounded planes for parts. There are about 10 to 15 non-flying hulks left that serve as organ donors for the survivors. They rely on companies like Aerospace Quality Research and Development. These guys have to custom fabricate parts. They have to get FAA exemptions. They have to certify repairs themselves. It is expensive. Annual costs can exceed $100,000 per plane just to keep it airworthy due to bespoke maintenance. This highlights a dedicated community that views the Starship as a flying testament to innovation. As of 2025, only about four to six remain airworthy. Four are registered and flying in the United States. Tail numbers N514, RS, N903SC, N723SC, and N45FL. Others are in museums like the Beechcraft Heritage Museum or grounded for parts. One was in Germany until recently. They are the zombies of the aviation world, kept alive by pure passion, operating outside the manufacturer's blessing. But here is the irony. The Starship was a failure. It was a billion-dollar mistake. But without it, modern aviation might look very different. The Starship pioneered the certification for carbon fiber. It was the crash test dummy for the industry. It was the first FAA-certified all-composite pressurized business aircraft in 1988. It established protocols for damage tolerance. It proved how to test composites for fatigue. Do you know what plane uses that knowledge today? The Boeing 787 Dreamliner. The Dreamliner is 50% composite. It was certified in 2011. The Airbus A350 uses carbon fiber to reduce weight by 20% and fuel use by 25%. Those planes are the direct descendants of the Starship. The Starship walked so the Dreamliner could run. It was the right plane at the wrong time. It was launched when interest rates were at 11% in 1989. It was launched before the FAA understood the technology. Its tech preceded widespread acceptance of composites which only boomed in the 2000s with material advancements. The destruction of the Starship fleet was not a safety decision, it was a cautionary tale. It shows what happens when corporate risk management overrides aviation heritage. The Starship did not die because it was dangerous, it died because it was inconvenient. This echoes broader industry trends. 
like Boeing's 737 MAX issues, where financial pressures can eclipse engineering. It reminds us that aviation progress often comes at the cost of bold failures like the Starship's 53-unit run. In the end, Raytheon tried to burn their mistake. They tried to bury it in the Arizona desert. But as long as those four ghost planes are still flying, the legacy of the Starship refuses to turn to ash. Was it a genius design killed by bureaucrats or was it a flawed ambition that deserved to die? Check out another video here.